welcome to Macros with Maithili, our weekly half-hour program where we usually take a hard look at all the major macroeconomic developments and challenges before the country. Today, however, we're going to break away from our usual pattern because we're privileged to have with us a very special guest, Professor Finn Kidland of the Norwegian School of Economics and Business Administration and winner of the 2004 Nobel Prize in Economics. The Nobel Committee has often been criticized for awarding the prize for work done decades ago and the 2004 Nobel in Economics is no exception. The award that Professor Kidland shared with Professor Edward Prescott of Carnegie was for his seminal work in 1977, the paper Rules Rather Than the Discretion, Inconsistency of Optimal Plans or the Time Inconsistency of Economic Policy and the Driving Force Behind Economic Business Cycles. But today, when discretion is a bad one in India and rules, whether on inflation targeting or fiscal deficit targets, seem better than having leaving it all to discretion, Professor Kidlin's work has special relevance to us. There is just one caveat. Can rules framed in a completely different economic environment be applied without tweaking in some of today's post-crisis world, where the economic order and rules of the game seem to have changed so fundamentally? And who better to answer that than Professor Kidlin himself? Welcome to the show, Professor. You've done some very seminal work on how economic policies are often plagued by problems of time and consistency and how society could gain from prior commitment to economic policy, as in, say, inflation targeting. But that was the late 1970s. Have your views changed since then? The sign uh, in practice of the problem of time and consistency is that short run, that policy is very short run focused. Uh, while uh, typically good economic policy, that is growth prom promoting uh, policy, is, um, is of long run nature because the important decisions are, are to accumulate things, to accumulate knowledge, to accumulate productive capacity. Uh, that's very expensive today, but uh, yield returns over many years in the future. So. Um, so that the the uh, the envir the view of the future economic uh, fiscal environment, the uh, future regulatory environment, and so on, are very important for those decisions. And so, if those decisions are, are focused on the short run, chances are that the economy will not do very well. And, and that's that's really. Uh, time inconsistency put in layman's terms. The problem of time inconsistency is no way more apparent than in the case of fiscal policy, especially in democracies, where elected governments have a very different time frame compared to monetary authorities. How can we get around that? Um, well, first let me say that I, I regard fiscal policy as much more important for long-run growth than, uh, than is monetary policy. Uh, th there isn't that much monetary policy can do, uh, um, but the uh, tax environment is can be extremely important. Uh, the view about what's going to happen to uh, government debt in the future and who's going to pay for it, and so on. Th these are these are fundamental decisions that, if uh, if uh, if businesses are uncertain about them they are not likely to jump on decisions with long-run implications. And those are the kinds of decisions we need to make economies grow at, at acceptable rates. Are there any countries that have really got over this conflict successfully? China, I think, is an example of uh, where policy is uh, about as consistent as, as uh, it can be, uh, at least uh, from an outsider's point of view. But to me, it's also a, an example of where consistent policy is not sufficient, where, uh, in other words, uh, it, it's not a good thing to have consistent policy that's at the same time bad policy. And uh, I, I think there are serious flaws with the Chinese economic policy, probably because it wasn't determined in, uh, within a democratic framework. There are examples where policy tends to be uh, d be quite consistent regardless of what party is in power. Uh, and I think uh, Scandinavian countries are an example of that. One of the big uh, problems in economics 
is that we, we don't really have a good way of committing future, po uh, future policy makers to, uh, to good economic policy. Uh, there was, and then on top of that, the time and consistency uh, suggests that they will always have a temptation in best of the best inten intentions to, uh, to fall back on uh, short-run policy that uh, could be quite damaging to societies in the long run. I sometimes joke that, and I suppose it's a little more than a joke, if, uh, that if uh, a hotshot economist uh, f discovers how to commit uh, governments to good future economic fiscal policy, um, in 20 or 30 years, he's, uh, he would be likely to stand before the King of Sweden and uh, receive a, uh, an important prize. Well, on that note, I'm afraid it's time for us to slip into a very short break, but we'll be back very soon. Welcome back. You're watching Macros with Maithili, and we're discussing the problem of time inconsistency with the winner of the Nobel Prize for Economics 2004, Professor Finn Kidlin. But first, just a little bit about time inconsistency, something that is best illustrated from what the well-known economist Gregory Mankou of Harvard University says in one of his lectures. Economists set a great deal of store by the phrase of Cetris Paribus, a Latin phrase that meaning other things remain constant. In reality, other things are never constants. So reliance on rigid rules in policy making is never a good idea. To give you one more example, again from Gregory Mancou's lecture at Harvard, the same problem arises less dramatically in the conduct of monetary policy. Consider the dilemma of a Federal Reserve that cares about both inflation and unemployment. According to the Phillips curve, the trade-off between inflation and unemployment depends on expected inflation. The Fed would prefer everyone to expect low inflation so that it will face a favourable trade-off. To reduce the expected inflation, the Fed might announce that low inflation is a paramount goal of monetary policy. But an announcement of a policy of low inflation by itself is not credible. Once households and firms have formed their expectations of inflation and set wages and price accordingly, the Fed has an incentive once again to renege on its announcement and implement expansionary monetary policy to reduce unemployment. People understand the Fed's incentive to renege and therefore do not believe the announcement in the first place. Just as a president facing a hostage crisis is sorely tempted to negotiate their release, a Federal Reserve with discretion is sorely tempted to inflate in order to reduce unemployment. And just as terrorists discount announced policies of never negotiating, households and firms also discount policies of low inflation whether announced by the Fed or not. The surprising outcome of this analysis is that policymakers can sometimes better achieve their goals by having their discretion taken away from them. Hence the argument that rules are better than discretion. Professor, before the break, we were talking about fiscal rules. But fiscal rules, if you see, haven't worked even in the EU, where countries like France and even Germany have found it very difficult to adhere to rigid targets for their fiscal deficit. So what really is the point of having these rules? The, uh, the fiscal rules may violate um, some principles that some economists uh, have uh, discovered, namely that the size of the definite deficit uh, ought to vary over the business cycle. So, so it's, one can see why it would be difficult to maintain a fixed percentage uh, as a, as a um, deficit rule. Um, so, so that just suggests that this is, this is a very difficult issue and, uh, uh, and something that one needs to uh, figure out in practice how it can be pulled off. But, but I think a bigger issue is that these days some countries are running deficits that are uh, so high that it makes one wonder who's going to pay for those deficits in the future, um, whose taxes will go up, and, and so on. And uh, that's part of the uh, uncertainty, and I would say unnecessary uncertainty, created in today's policy environment in many countries. You said fiscal policy is more important than monetary policy. But in the post-crisis world, it seems to be that monetary policy has come to the forefront, while fiscal policy has become less important. Is that how it's going to be in future as well? Uh, I, I think that's 
misplaced uh, focus and uh, it may become clearer eventually the sense in which there was a misplaced focus. Um, certain aspects of, of what was done in monetary in the monetary arena in 2008 uh, were uh, there were good aspects of uh, well-run monetary policy. The the idea of uh, injecting more liquidity when uh, what in economics we call the money multiplier fell, where uh, there, there was a danger of otherwise um, depression uh, setting in. Um, but that was a good aspect of uh, at least what what I saw being done in the United States. But the, um, the quantitative easing that has taken place, uh, I know of no uh, good economic theory suggesting that that will have had or potentially would have much of an effect on the real economy. And uh, it, it, it's kind of interesting to see, in spite of the quantitative easing, uh, the, the U.S. economy has continued to grow at slower rates than the trend over the past uh, 60 years. Uh, in other words, moving further and further away from, uh, from a trend that, from which it had fell by, initially fell by on the order of 10 or 12 percent. How should emerging market economies like India guard against the possible fallout of an interest rate hike in the U.S.? It's clear that this, the slow economy in, in main, many major countries uh, is not so good for countries that depend a lot about exports to these countries. And, and if that's the case for India, uh, that would represent some, some uh, source of, uh, of slower growth. But I think nations, if they, if they play their cards well, they can more or less, they can insulate themselves fairly well from uh, from those kinds of developments, and uh, I think India and other and emerging countries in in general, they they should have that view. Try to make their economies more productive over time. Um, that's a key driver of economic growth. Uh, try to make the uh, the uh, young people more educated, because uh, with uh, with uh, newer technologies, uh, they often depend on people with the right kinds of skills. Uh, if you look at some uh, uh, very new countries, such as uh, Kazakhstan and, and Azerbaijan, quite resource-rich countries, the, they are examples of countries that have managed to, to uh, they have managed their uh, resources very well. They have grown at very fast rates so much so that if you talk to them, they will say, uh, well, what, what, what is difficult for us now is that we don't have the people with the right skills. They are diff difficult to find, but at the same time, they are wise enough to take the consequences and uh, develop their educational system. They built new universities and, and, and so on. Um, so, so, um, so basically, uh, focus on incentives for innovative activity and te technological change. Much knowledge is available from uh, that you could even import, but uh, they also depend on uh, finding people with, people with the right skills. Uh, in other words, a good educational system, a, a good uh, basis for for future growth, and of course, incentives for businesses to. Um, to, to build productive capacity to take advantage of all of this. Well, I'm afraid it's time for us to slip into another very short break, but please do stay with us. Welcome back. You're watching Macros with Maithili, and we're discussing the problem of time inconsistency with a 2004 Nobel Prize winner, Professor Finn Kidland. 
Well, rules may be better than discretion, particularly in countries like India, Professor, where governments tend to go in for short-term populist measures. But in a world where change is the only constant, is it wise to adhere to rules that were framed in an altogether different scenario? The rule could be a contingent rule. It's a, it could be a contingent rule that where, uh, where policy depends on something that's well understood, although it, it wouldn't be wise, I suppose, to make it too complicated. But uh, now, in the case of monetary policy, which is what you uh, uh, now emphasize, uh, monetary policy can be geared towards trying to provide certainty about where the price path will end up in uh, one, one year, five years, ten years from now. Um, clearly there will be sources of fluctuations around that path that the central bank cannot prevent. But as, as long as there's a fair amount of certainty about where the price level will end up uh, in, uh, in the, uh, not just the near, but fairly distant future, that, that would be ha the hallmark of a uh, reasonable uh, rule for monetary policy making. Is there a trade-off between growth and inflation? Uh, I don't think there's much uh, trade-off uh, in that respect. Obvi there's always a little bit, but but uh, it sounds like you're talking about something. I is there something of uh, sizable quantitative magnitude? And uh, I would say uh, no, within reasonable limits. Uh, a, uh, a hyperinflation, for example, would be devastating to economic growth, but uh, in the range of uh, two, uh, one to four or five percent, I would say uh, not, not much, not, not, not a big deal. If you could do some crystal gazing, how would you see the world economy after the US Fed has not only raised the Fed rate, but more importantly, shrunk the size of its bloated balance sheet to a more normal size? That's an interesting question and uh, that's a, a, an important source of uncertainty in, uh, for the next two or three years and maybe a reason why the economy is not doing better than, than, uh, than it should. It's very unusual for, a, for a, an economy, for, for the economy to recover as slowly as it has done in the, after 2008-2009. In past recessions, the economy always recovered quickly. Um, there must be something different about this economy, and I think the main reason is, is uncertainty about future. Uh, well, you're emphasizing um, monetary policy, but I think even, even more important, uncertainty about future fiscal policy, about the future tax environment, and so on. Well, I'm afraid that's all the time we have in this episode of Macros with Maithili. Thank you so much, Professor Kidland, for joining us and discussing the problems of time inconsistency, which is of particular relevance to countries like India. Thank you also for watching. We'll be back next week, same time, with yet another edition of Macros with Maithili. Till then, it's thank you and goodbye from all of us at ET Now. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash etnow and don't forget to click the like button. You can also follow us on Twitter at etnowlive. To stay updated with all our programming, hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel by logging on to youtube.com slash user slash etnow.